Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast, presented exclusively on the Chop Sports channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We're recording this on Monday, April 3rd. Goodbye, March. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, City stomp Liverpool, Newcastle win the Battle of Uniteds versus Manchester, and Arsenal hold serve. But first, the great sword has swung. Like Oprah Winfrey, you get a sack. You get a sack. You get a sack. Rodgers and Potter are out of Leicester and Chelsea, respectively. Wow, what a weekend we have. Before we get into that, please like, share, subscribe. Like, share, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. If you are on a podcast, please follow. We want you to listen to the show. We want you to be a part of it. This show is great. The fans are great. And I want you to get involved. So let's get uh, right into it. Uh, late yesterday, Graham Potter was fired by Chelsea Football Club after seven months in charge, 31 games. He did not have a good run. Um, as you guys all know, I am a massive fan of Graham Potter. Uh, I'm also a fan, I think, of Brendan Rodgers. He's done well. Both these managers, I think there's some similarities. Uh, Rodgers comes from Chelsea. They both did manage uh, Swansea at one time or another. And both are progressive managers whose infrastructure, I think, has let them down more than they're coaching themselves. But we'll start with Potter. Potter is an interesting case. Um, he comes out of his Brighton time and his time, frankly, with Ostersunds, which is where I found him first when he played in the Europa League against Arsenal. And I learned his story about making guys sing and trying to get team unity and, you know, all these really interesting ways for man management. And then under Brighton, just how much I loved how they played, how much they they just did things that you wouldn't expect the team that was promoted to do, especially after he took over for Chris Hewton. Um, you know, they were a team that was battling out of the relegation zone, but in the Allardyce, Dyche, Pulis style, where it's just, we're going to put eight behind the ball and try and not lose and stay in this league and versus Potter, who got the first season, got the exact same points number in the exact same place, but completely transformed how they did it. It was more in the Eddie Howe style of young English managers who've grown up or come of age under the Pep era and were more progressive, didn't mind giving up goals, but would attack. Um, and that's what made me fall in love with Potter was this tinkering, this progressive, this style of we're going to go win this game. And the only thing was, was, oh, I wish they would just score more goals. I wish they had a goal scorer. Uh, it was Neil Mope. It was Danny Welbeck. It was all these players that just could not finish their goals um, and this, you thought, oh, what's wrong with this team? And, you know, one season they were like a plus 10 in XG difference, but they were minus, which meant they weren't finishing chances between Melpe and Welbeck. They just couldn't get anything done. I want to give a shout out to Glenn Murray, who was also there, who's a really good player for Brighton and a, and a servant of the club. Um, but he takes the opportunity and he did this with Swansea, to be fair. So Graham Potter, don't let his calm demeanor be uh, um, hide the fact that he is ambitious. He did ditch Swansea for the Brighton job to be in the Premier League. He had a good season when they uh, sort of fell apart after the Bob Bradley era and they had the American owners and they had to cut price. And that's what they haven't been in the Premier League since. But I do remember a game in the FA Cup where Swansea were up 2 nil and only a miraculous city comeback got them level to then have a replay. Uh, but they were fantastic that game. Uh, Brent Selena, a, a former City player, was amazing. And that was one of the moments where I thought, oh, Grand Potter's really good. And then from there, you know, he he takes, he's got all the plaudits of 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 Brighton. And he was had this team in the top four early in the season. And the Tuchel firing comes in September. We can talk about, we'll talk about that institutional damage after that, that Bowley's brought in. But then we have Potter come into Chelsea and really nothing changes from the Chelsea perspective. Uh, the first steps are 
He puts in Arizabalaga Kepa over Mendy, and though it was injury force, and there's a hiding or a sort of uh, a sort of uh, moment where Kepa's playing out of his mind and really hiding the fact that Chelsea aren't good. Uh, they're not scoring. They're having the same problems they had had under Tuchel, uh, just under on-field performance-wise. And that never changes. It continues the same way. And then you have the bully of buying players. You've got Obama Young. You've got all these players that Tuchel was allowed to bring in. Then they fire him literally three weeks after the uh, transfer deadline's in. So then Potter's in. All the coaches go. It's all Potter's coaches. So there's that. And then you have this sort of, they sort of muddle through kind of, oh, he needs time, he needs time, he needs time. Then we have this crazy transfer window where, you know, they buy another tranche of players for another 300 million. So I, the money is not interesting uh, to me. Clearly, Bowley is getting played. Clearly, Bowley is, is a mark. Clearly, all the agents in Europe see a guy with money and he's not, he's taking things from the American perspective and just getting played. Anyway, that's not important. What's important, though, is that Potter is given a difficult hand. He's given a team of players who probably half of them are over $50 million players. None of them are his. And there's like 35 of them. If you know anything about football clubs, there is no roster limit the way the Premier League is run. Um, yes, on a day, you have to submit 18 players to play. Um, but really, the number of players you have under contract on your first team is open. You have to name them on a, on a, on, for certain competitions in Champions League or for the season. But otherwise, you can have lots of players. And the issue for Chelsea was they had three managers worth of players on the team. Half of them were new. And my understanding is that they would do 11 v 11s, which is a sort of standard, hey, let's play the starters versus the bench versus some of the young kids. But then they'd have to have a whole other group of 18 doing 9 v 9 drills. So Potter's got this giant squad. He's new. He can't make mistakes. He can't learn on the job. And his philosophy is not getting through to the team. I want you to know, I watched Brighton more than I watched City, almost, almost more under Potter. And this was a progressive team that was on the front foot that had a way of playing with fullbacks high, all the things that were indicative of a manager in control of his men on the field. And he would move players around. They would go to a three, go to a four, and all those things would happen. And the players would move almost like a chessboard. They bought in to what Potter was selling. And, and I do remember him taking over for Houghton and being shocked how he turned the team from a 4-4-2 defensive cloud of dust team into this other team overnight. And he was not getting that from Chelsea at all. Zero. Zero. Now, Chelsea have structural issues on the field that I think are really underrated. They don't have a creative midfielder to save their lives. And if you look at how things worked with Potter, they were at their best when Adam Lallana was there or they had Pasquale Gross in the middle. These were technical guys who would, or, or Trussard. Trussard is a perfect example. Uh, Lallana and Trussard really punching things through, making creative moves to get balls through the midfield. Very creative midfielders. Now, Chelsea don't really have that. They're better players, but they don't sort of break things down through the midfield. This has been the issue with Chelsea. It's why all their strikers always fail. No one passes the ball through the midfield. They don't have a line-breaking, number 10-type creative passer. That's what's been killing Chelsea. That's why their strikers don't score anything. Everything that's creative comes from the wings. Reese James and Chilwell. But when Potter was there, they were both out. So a lot of Potter's time, he never really had his whole team. Then you've got this World Cup. So a lot of weird things are happening. Uh, and so that's the side that absolves Potter. Um, and and now the next piece, I think, in the middle here is what's going on at Chelsea. I've spent a few episodes and a few minutes here or there talking about institutions. And this is where we'll bring uh, Lester together. The institution of Chelsea, as it is understood, 
with the Abramovich era that had time to buy its way in and then settle itself with Mourinho did continue the legacy. And I talked about this during Viali's death, the legacy of what Chelsea are. They are a working class, flashy London team, but keep their roots in defense, in tough mindedness, epitomized with Viali, with Zola, with Frank LaBeouf, with Steve Clark, on through to John Terry, on through to guys like Craig Burley, on through this team that is tough, uh, Dennis Wise, uh, Mark Hughes. These are players that epitomize the English toughness that is Chelsea. And that carried through institutionally into the Mourinho era, into um, into all that time. That's why a guy like Robin, uh, Iron Robin, while a good Chelsea player was never quite, didn't quite fit in, or Shevchenko didn't quite fit in. They didn't have that verve that is permeated through Chelsea. And Abramovich carried that, and that stayed within the team. And that carried on. Chelsea are at their best as a defensive-minded, in-your-face team. Potter is not that. Potter is not that. So that's a mark against him. He's not that. So that's like institutional. But then what you have after the Abramovich is ousted by the by the Ukrainian war and the sanctions put on by the British government is everything that is Chelsea from the back room is erased. There's no check. There's no buck. There's no Graniskaya, even down to the marketing. They've essentially, Chelsea sits there, the building's there, the blue is there, the fans are there, but everything inside Chelsea is ripped out. So they have no institutional strength. That's why Potter is hired, but it doesn't connect. The fans are still one step behind in that they're holding on to, this is an Abramovich Chelsea, we have to be what we have to be. And all of it is disjointed. And then you have Broly, who is bringing an American bravado, um, the way he's run the Dodgers. He's trying to be, you know, he's talking shit. He's he's phony. He's releasing press releases. He's not quite connecting with British culture. You know, even in the in the Potter firing, they're talking about him, you know, staying on and helping. That's so American to do it that way. And right now, this team is just listless. It has no identity. And I think Potter was there to try and give an identity and try and connect it all together, but he just couldn't, he couldn't get his ideas across. They were just playing as a group and Potter didn't help to be fair. He had all those 30 players. And I think he thought he was doing the right thing by rotating and trying to get everyone involved by using all five subs every game, by changing the back four all the time, by changing things all the time to try and appease and, and have the players be happy when in fact, He needed to be ruthless, and he doesn't have that. Or, sorry, that's not true. He clearly has ambition. He clearly works hard. He doesn't have the outward appearance of ruthlessness. What he needed to do was find a back four, find a front three, find a group of players that were reliable and that he could put on on the score sheet and just let them play. It needed to be Silva, Fofana, Chilwell, James. And don't change it. I don't care about Cucurella. I don't care about uh, Badashiel. I don't care about any of that. Put your four best in the back. Always play Kovacic because he's your most creative player. And then play Mason Mount because he carries the institutional strength of Chelsea. Let everyone else complain. Everything else comes from a consistency of like, these are my guys. This is my decision. This is what we're doing. And he never did that. And so everything felt disjointed. Every game, every result felt like something was off, that he missed something, that he was tinkering too much, that he was changing something. Is that his personality? I don't know. But that's what his downfall was. So what happens to Potter now? He has a scarlet letter. He bottled it. He can't handle a big club. He um, has to go back down a level, maybe even below your Aston Villa level. Maybe he gets a Leicester job. Maybe he, you know, he swindles Spurs into it, but I don't think Levy will do that. He's got to go down, rebuild his his thing again, and go again. Uh, I think he should take time. 
Uh, I think if we saw what had happened to Moyes, he went to Real Sociedad, he went to Sunderland, and then he landed at West Ham this season aside. Um, but that's where he is right now. Uh, juxtapose that to um, Brendan Rodgers, who, let's be fair to him, is a really, really good coach who gets really, really good performances out of his players, especially in the first two or three years. Liverpool fans, you can bo you can bother him, you can be mean to him, but let me tell you that 13-14 team with Luis Suarez was one of the most exciting teams I've ever seen in my life, aside from the second season with Klopp, the first Salah season, that team was fantastic. So those two teams, to me, are the most exciting Liverpool teams. Not the best, but the most exciting. So 13-14 Liverpool scored 105 goals, give up 50, insane. Luis Suarez out of his mind. And then the first Salah team where they gave up, they finish in fourth, but Salah scores 31 and they make it to the Champions League final. That's the, that's the, that's the, uh, uh, Salah's shoulder season. So Br Rogers has a good amount of skill, a good manager. Uh, he may not be great with transitioning a team away from the one he inherits, but what happened with Lester is, um, they had their their owner die. His name is impossible. The original owner who died in a helicopter accident, his son taking over the team, clearly is not a hardcore football guy. And then the pandemic really hurt their business because they made all their money on Southeast Asian duty-free and um, airport services, like all the stores, all your Hudson News of Thailand. And so that's how they made all their money and they ran that really well. And... Um, Vichy, I think, is the original guy. And so those transfer, the transfer money left um Leicester. And the big at the beginning of this season, they got no players in. So Schmeichel goes out, he loses some of his leaders, loses some of the institutional strength. So what we have with Leicester is the institution is still relatively strong, but it's weakening and crumbling. And then you have a moment that's actually Leicester, I think, are somewhat similar to Liverpool in that their team aged without any replacements happening or their replacements have not kicked on. Uh, we have Daka never really replaced Vardy. Ihenacho has stretches where he can be good for 10 games and not. They really function only because James Madison makes it work. Uh, Dewsbury Hall has taken over some slack in the midfield. Tielemans has been out, but the defense is where everything disappeared. Uh, it used to be that when they were at their best, it was Johnny Evans and Soyenchu. Then Soyenchu just inexplicably exploded and disappeared. Uh, and then Johnny Evans, of course, older, had been carried the legacy of the old Man United teams. And it worked in a back three and they were fine. Um, and then I, the Pereira uh, Castagna thing never really worked out again. And they just kind of, la this, last season, they gave up set piece, set piece, set piece, set piece. And then in January, he gets two players. He gets Suter and Vout Faust. Uh, but it, they pick up, but then it kind of slops down again. Um, and Rogers is unable to get out of it. This has been the story with Rogers. He seems to have a problem getting out or getting to the next phase. And by the way, this is how a lot of managers are. Uh, it's really hard. Football management is really hard. Getting three years on the job is really hard. The average Premier League manager, I think, is now 18 months. Uh, we just had in this season... 13 manager changes on 12 teams. Southampton, thank you for doing it twice. Um, so we've, we, Roberto De Zerbi is now the 11th most tenured manager in the Premier League, and he started this season. So we have a sense. So we have Rodgers disappearing. We have, but, but for, for Rodgers, I think he has a really good opportunity to go to another team and restart. Um, I could see him. You know, going to Spurs, I think he would be fine. I know Spurs fans don't want to hear that, but you've never had uh, him as a manager. So you don't know. I think he is a good manager. He would be able to work within the the structure of, of Spurs and Levy sort of buying the players for him. Uh, I think that he would be fine, especially in the beginning. Um, and, and even works with young players. If you think about it, he brought through Raheem Sterling. He brings through Tielemans. He brings through James Madison. Um, you know, there are a lot of good players. It's just the last, the last year has been tough. Um, and then, you know, he did have those two near top four finishes. He lost 
one on the last day of the season against Man United. It let Ole get in, sneak past him, and then one other one where it was a real surprise. But they've played such good stuff. I think Lester and and Rogers has to be given credit. I mean, not everyone can be on the merry-go-round of the seven managers that everybody wants. You've got to have managers that are just normal guys that are good. And Rogers is a normal guy that is good. He's not quite a Champions League manager, but he's just beneath. He's a Europa League manager. Uh, you know, he's 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 not as good as Unai Emery, but Unai Emery is specific. He's got to be in his right team. Um, but that's really all I've got on the managers. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, I really like to think about all the institutional stuff and what it means. You know, I think I literally talked about this last week of like, what is a good manager? When do they get there? It's so much involved with timing and players and when and how and whether you fit because football more than anything is about the institutions. They have history. They're living and breathing things because coupled with the owners and the fans of the players, there's an ethos that surrounds a club that, you know, carries them. And um, I know, I know Manny will laugh at me, but um, some clubs have to suffer. And there is a suffering going on with certain clubs right now. Like Spurs have been suffering. It's really been tough on them uh, to have to go through Mourinho, who was dour, and and Conte, who was dour this season, not last, not last. And then Nuno, and and just really never able to get back the pure love and pure joy that Pochettino brought. Uh, especially even in the last season, the league went away, but those Champions League games against Ajax, against City, even the final was such a moment. They never were able to get back to that joy, and it's really been downhill since then in terms of moments, in terms of joy. I mean, you've had games, you beat City, you have you have games against Arsenal, but really as an overall big moment, Spurs have lost that. And I'm fascinated by what a club is. What What is it as, a, as an entity, as a living breathing institution clubs are their own things and they have all these sayings about them and spurs are spursy and this is arsenally and this is wangery and oh man united want their club back from who from where oh this is the man united way oh this is the chelsea way oh where, where i want chelsea back back what what are you looking for and no one can define it but they know it when they see it like klopp becoming liverpool's manager was just like boom this is the right guy so very interesting stuff. And I think Rodgers is probably the better one to land on his feet versus Potter. Although we could see a merry-go-round. Uh, I saw a tweet going that was Nogglesman to Chelsea, Potter to Leicester, Rodgers to Spurs. I think that was the, the merry-go-round of managers. And then, of course, we have Real Madrid may be available as well. Anyway, that is all the manager stuff. Now, there's been so much going on. Let's get to the football which was, of course, I want to talk about my team. Manchester City 4, Liverpool 1. What a fucking performance it was. Good fucking Christ. Um, I'll start with City. Uh, just such not a bad performance in the whole group. Every player in sync, even the first half, which was much more competitive than the second the first half was tough and Liverpool were playing really well, but I never felt like City were in trouble. Um, no Holland for this, but Alvarez was fantastic. Grealish was fantastic. Mares was fantastic. The whole back four, um, the, oh, sorry, back five now because City play this weird hybrid three, two, two, three, three, two, four, one, where John Stones is just in the midfield hanging out not a right back anymore, just in the midfield with Rodri playing a double pivot. Um, and then there's two eights and two tens. So Gundo and and De Bruyne playing where they want, moving around, interchanging with Grealish and Mares, really wide, really causing problems for who to mark them. And then Alvarez linking things together, dropping into the midfield, making runs in behind. Just all of it was really good. Um, but then Liverpool, as they do, as they are so good at it, give respect to them. Um, you know, Trent Alexander Arnold had TAA, one of his passes that was fantastic onto Sala. I'm uh, sorry, onto Jota. Jota then holds it off. Akanji could have they tried to play offside. Maybe there was a foot too many. Whatever, it's fine. Um, he 
Akanji does stop Jota, but then uh, Salah following up slams at home. And, and Liverpool, sucker punch City. They they just steal a goal. And you're like, oh, fucking goddamn Liverpool. You're so fucking liverpool you bastards. I fucking hate you. I hope you all die in a fire. But as much as that was happening, um, you know, City did come back into the game. And then the second goal, the first goal for City by... Um, by by Alvarez is just pure city football. It goes through the hands of half the team. Maybe one player doesn't touch it. It's on the back of a near goal where Jack Grealish runs across the field to stop Salah from a near perfect wide open goal. He blocks the, the cross inside the inside this just before they get to the six yard box. And then going back the other way, a full city buildup out to out to Mares, who cuts inside, leaves it to Gundogan. Gundogan on a dime in the middle, outside the D, just top turn out to out to Grealish, who takes on Trent, nutmegs him, pass into Alvarez, and City are up. And that goal was just so city. Um, it looked very much like previous versions of City, earlier Pep seasons, where the team is grooved and everything's flying around and you feel the energy and they're bomb, 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 bomb. The ball's flying around. There's not, the pace is fast. The the rhythm is good. And City just looked different. There was no dallying on the ball. Everyone knew where the next ball was going to go. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, one of the, It's one of the things I haven't seen much from City this year, especially in, the, in that little lull period when, after the Newcastle game, up until about a month ago, City were listless. They were kind of losing it. They had the draw against Newcastle. They had the draw against Everton. And things were just a little funky, and they couldn't find Holland. And it was a little bit of a moment. And then, boom, they got back into gear. Pep Guardiola found his answer. He's got this now, this WM that he basically has gone back to the 30s. That's what City are playing. They're playing a formation that... Herbert Chapman invented in 1932 with Arsenal. They're playing the WM. Look it up. It's insane that Pep goes back to like the fourth century. It's an amazing, uh, just a great coach. I'm looking at the formation right in front of me on the screen. And I'm like, oh yeah, there it is. WM. Amazing stuff from Pep. They just go back to the fucking, you got to go back into the, he went to the crates and found a, a style to play that just has city humming. And, um, Liverpool first half, I thought, oh, 1-1, one, one. this is going to be a tough one. We're going to grind it out. I feel good about where we are. We're bouncing the ball around. Really good, really interesting, and a fantastic kind of way that that City were playing. So we go into the break, and I saw an amazing thing that uh, the guys in TIFO IRL said, and it's that Liverpool from the kickoff have the same play every single time. It drops back into into Fabinho and he kicks it into um, the far corner and they try and win it up high just to try and get on the front foot. Nothing crazy, nothing like, oh, uh, you know, some some genius figured it out. But it looks like in this moment, City did figure out and had their own set play on the back of it. So before Liverpool could get set in their high line back in order, City were going the other way. Um, the ball goes into, um, the ball goes into, into Alvarez, who passes it on to, sorry, ball goes into Alvarez, who passes it on to Grealish, onto De Bruyne. It happens in a flash, and, you know, there's just a four on three the other way uh, because um, because Liverpool get caught flat-footed. De Bruyne is intentionally offside. His teams are getting smarter. They're using that offside position the way Rashford did to start offside and throw a high line off. So De Bruyne is beyond the last defender, but not. But the ball isn't played to him. So the ball's played onside. He's offside, then slows down, lets the run come in five, gets himself back onside. It throws off Allison. It throws off Van Dyke. They don't mark him properly. He's wrong side of the defender. And he's just in on goal by himself, waiting for the pass from Grealish, who makes it and uh, on City go to score their second. Um the hearts, the hearts of um the hearts of Liverpool drop. Then they give up another one on 53. And and it's and it's on a shot from from Alvarez that Gundogan boxes in. That goal on 53 really destroys Liverpool, and they're done after that. 
But in that goal, Liverpool have eight players in the box. The ball's shot from deep. Nobody moves. They're all just standing there like they're fucking uh, Sabutio players or, or, or foosball. They have the players there. No one engages a city player, puts a body on the ball, puts a man to mark, and Gundogan just slots at home. 3-1, City are through. This game is effectively over. It's a really sad state of affairs that Liverpool gave up. I'm sorry. They gave up. Um, Manny and I got into a little argument. I was like, where is Liverpool? Somebody kick someone. He said it's Bush League. But I think that that's what Liverpool needed Bush League. Liverpool needed to fucking say, we're here. We're not pussies. Um, you know, we, we got into a little bit of a tiff about uh, whether, you know, someone's hand- diving or whatever is the wrong thing to do. That's not the, that, the, he feels that's the wrong thing to do, but getting stuck in and kicking someone isn't the right thing to do. Rather just, you know, just get beat. Um, so he makes, he does the checking line. He brings in Oxlade, Chamberlain, Nunez, Firmino, and Simikas on 70. That means it's 15 minutes where Liverpool just don't do anything. They're just dead. Nothing happened for the last I don't know, since from 53, they gave up 40 minutes of nothing from Liverpool. Nothing. They disappeared. They were finished. They were washed up. And that is indicative of this Liverpool side right now. They capitulate. They stop playing. It happened against Real. They went up two goals at home and disappeared. This was the same. They were Olayed for 10 minutes. It was bad. There was a Poznan. City do not do this to Liverpool. This is not indicative of our challenges, of our rivalry. It's always a war. And someone is not showing up. And it's Liverpool. They're out of ammo. They're exhausted. They're finished. They don't have it. I saw something. um, I'm going to go look up this game. But effectively, Liverpool have not changed their squad. Uh, and I think that th- there's a one game that's indicative of where this team is. So let's let's just look at the names. Let's just look at the names in this game, right? So uh, Liverpool have Salah, Gakpo, Jota, Henderson, Fabinho, Elliott, um, Konate, Van Dyke, Robertson, TAA, and Allison, right? But let's look. Let's look at a game from. Uh, uh, let's look at a game from 2019. I just want to show you. And then City just re- completely reloaded their team. Well, anyway, I'm not going to go through it. But as- effectively, that January 3rd, 2019 game that I talk about all the time because it's my favorite City game <laughs> uh, during the ni- during the, um, during the 98-point season where City and Liverpool just go to war. That home game, the John Stones off the line game, if you look at the lineup, for that game, Liverpool still have eight players who feature per, uh, who feature prominently from that game. That game is now four years ago. City have none. John Stones is basically the only, and Ederson are ba- and De Bruyne are basically the only players that are still playing regularly from that game. You know, um, I'm just gonna go to it. I'm just closing something out. I'm gonna. Get the match report right here. So January 3rd, you know, City didn't deserve to win that game, but they did win. But look at City's lineup. Aguero, Sané, Sterling, Silva didn't play this game. Fernandinho didn't play. Uh, David Silva is no longer on the team. De Bruyne didn't even play this game. Laporte was at fullback. Company, Stones, Danilo, and Ederson. So basically two players from that game. No, City didn't have not had two players from that game four years ago were playing in this one. In this one, we've got Henderson. James Milner played in that game. Jeannie Wijnaldum. Salah. The whole back the whole back four. It's Lovren, but it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then, you know, Milner still came on. Um, you know, Nabi Kate is still on this team. Just not the same level of player. Not the same refreshing. Not the same level of changing players. 
and City have reloaded. They they change styles. They change everything. Liverpool is still playing a 4-3-3 with a high line. So we've got to say, you know, as much as, and I know the money's not the same. I know whatever. But Pep's continual change and evolution makes sure the team doesn't get stale. That's why City can go again and are in for a third title in a row. And Liverpool are falling apart after trying to go for a quadruple. Just different strokes for different folks. I talked a lot about that game. (laughs) Um, I should go into uh, our other friends in the title race, Arsenal. They have an easy go against uh, Leeds. A little bit of criticism for Leeds. They went very defensive. They have a game midweek against Nottingham Forest that they probably really need. So they didn't play um, any of their big players. They didn't play Rodrigo. They didn't play um, Bamford. Too afraid to hurt them. But I thought, to be fair, I watched the first 20 minutes of this game. I thought Leeds were pretty good. Uh, They had decent chances, especially early uh, in the game. You know, you had Leeds took three of the first four shots in the game, had a really good chance, uh, probably with Harrison, was probably the best of their three. Somerville's was okay. Then Jesus draws the penalty, gets kicked in the knee by um, by Luke Ailing. The goal goes in, and essentially leads are dead. Once that goal goes in, they sort of lose any impetus that they had in the game. And I have to say for, for um, Arsenal, they carry on. They've had now... Four easy games in a row, never really pressured. They haven't had to go through a squeaky bum time, if you will, yet. And um, they carry on. The narrative for them is they have now have Jesus back in. Uh, they've gotten through their moments. They they haven't had to deal with Rob Holding being a problem because they're not really getting pressured. I mean, the idea that Rob Holding is playing a prominent role in the run-in for a Premier League title is the legacy of Arsene Wenger. Uh, I can't believe that a Barnsley reject with a hairpiece is still playing a prominent role for Arsenal. Just curious to show that maybe Gabriel is the better of the two defenders with Saliba. But, you know, I'm I'm, te- I'm teasing him. But, you know, good to see Gabi get his goal. Uh, Trossard played uh, along with Martinelli. They got Saka, who is – there's been a, a some kind of flu going around in Europe uh, through a couple teams now. Um so Saka came on late. You thought that maybe there was a problem, but no. Leeds are just not quite at it yet, not able to um, really really blast through, really make it happen yet. And they are on a relegation battle. We'll get to that because that's one of the prominent stories of the match week. Um, and so that's really where they are. Arsenal roll on. They tick another game, another game. Every game that they don't drop points moves them steps closer to the title. Ten, eight, nine games to go for Arsenal. Nine games to go. They have Chelsea. They have City. They have Liverpool. Anfield on Saturday. If they win at Anfield, they're winning the title. That's just a fact. So uh, I'm get, am I going to root for Liverpool? You bet your fucking ass I'm going to root for Liverpool. <laughs> Come on, Liverpool. Come on. Um, and then we'll go to um we'll go to talk to our friends, Newcastle to Manchester United nil. Dude, United got smoked badly. They were not up for this game at all. Uh the Vout Veghorst shine and experience is not working. And again, as goes Rashford, goes this team. No Casemiro, no Partey. McTominay back in with Sabitzer. I feel like Fred needed to be in this game, maybe. Uh, I don't know what happened with... Um, uh, no, I guess not. Some players not ready. Having Dallow there with Luke Shaw, it's just not working for them right now. And there was no force. There was no energy. There was really nothing from united i don't think they took a shot they had two shots in the early in the first half only took six shots the whole game and what we saw from newcastle was they've gotten over their hump they've gotten over that draw period they've gotten over that league cup loss to united and they've seemed to have swapped places where they're kicking on they're going forward and united are in a little bit of a lull a little bit of their dip a little bit of their sort of what's this season for can we pick it back up? And I think this is a moment when Ten Hogs got to push this team and get them back going. 
They can't win on the road. They've gave up goals in bucket loads United on the road. Um, they're really bad on the road. Uh, they have a hard time against better opponents. So I think against the top nine, uh, against top nine teams away from home, they've given up something like almost 35 goals, which is half of what you should give up when you could juxtapose that to Newcastle, who've only given up 19 all season. This Newcastle team is really good. Even when they were going through their bad period, their issue was that they couldn't score and they couldn't break teams down. If you come at them and you try and dictate play against Newcastle, they will fuck you up. That's just what they do. If you sit deep and go on a counter, Newcastle will have a hard time. I don't think they have the creative players to do it yet, but they their dip did come with Gilmarais out. Uh, Willock scored after score after having like two or three chances, and then Callum Wilson got a goal late. Uh, I thought Isaac, even though he didn't score a goal, put himself about um, the first after Veghurst shot on target on twelve. It was all Newcastle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten shots to United's one. Then the goal comes from Willock who had deserved one, a really good header. St. Maximin, what a fucking man. I absolutely adore him. I cannot get enough of Alan St. Maximin. I just fucking love him. He's so maverick-like. Now he's got braids in the back. He looks like something out of Predator. He's such a live wire. I don't care if he doesn't track back. I don't care if he doesn't score goals. I fucking love Alan St. Maximin. If you're not watching Newcastle and you are not checking out Alan St. Maximin, Please do yourself a favor. Part of sport is entertainment. He's by far the most entertaining player in the league. He's everywhere. He created, oh my God, look how many chances he created. Let me just look at the stats really quick. Um, sc uh, scoring chances created by Alan St. Maximin. Oh, seven. <laughs> With Trippier also scoring, creating eight just creates one of the goals. St. Maximin and, and Trippier, both of the assists. Willick with the goal, along with Callum Wilson late, just in the middle of the box on a cross from Trippier. Just no problem. Uh, really tough loss, and I think now United have a real struggle on their hands to make the top four. They need to fight. They need to find it in them. They need another player to step up. Rashford carried them for a good long period. They need someone else for the goals to come. If you notice... Teams that are really good, they're never carried by one player all season. It rotates. It goes from one player to the next. Some, so if you think about City, sometimes it's De Bruyne. Then, you know, now it's been Grealish for the last few weeks. Or Holland is in the goals. Now, you know, different players contributing. Um, for Newcastle, it was Almiron, 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 Almiron. And then the defense was holding them together. They were getting good results. Now they've gotten back Gumeresh. He's making things happen. Isaac pushed them up. You need players at different times of the season to step up and supplement what you do from a coaching structure to break teams down and have moments, right? I think that's one of the issues with Liverpool. It's Salah or nothing. Right. And they don't have any fight. None of the midfielders are stepping up. None of the defenders are saving them. Allison's not saving them anymore. Trent Alexander is not saving them anymore. They can only win one way. Uh, and for United, it was just Rashford and Bruno for a while. And now both of them have sort of uh, slipped a little bit. Rashford's not getting quite those goals that he needs that luck, that rub of the green, those runs. Bruno's not seeing him. They need Casemiro to sort of help their offense get into gear that half a second on a half turn, making the pass at the right moment. If you slow down in football, even a fraction of a second or pass that ball to someone's back foot, you don't know the chance that doesn't get created because you made a bad pass. So that's where I think United are right now, a drop in quality that's making their offense not be as fluid and they're not getting into the attack, not able to get it to Rashford to then Go on the offensive, which everything, again, is connected. You don't get on attack. You lose the ball in the midfield. Then it's coming back your way, and you get dominated the way they did against the force of Newcastle. So we'll see where they go for their next uh, games. But, you know, I, I don't worry necessarily for, for United, but, you know, I've talked about it all season. Their underlying numbers are not good. Only a plus four in goal difference. That's not going to be good enough to get – um, them through at all. Um, 
from our other top four friends or or nearby. Uh, we didn't we didn't really have to talk about the result for Chelsea because of the Grand Potter firing, but the catalyst for the Potter firing was another Potterian uh, result, another Chelsearian uh, result. 2-0 to Aston Villa. Unai Emery secretly, quietly having a manager of the season kind of campaign. And this is one of those games, and I should talk about it a little bit, around XG, where the XG story is not accurate. Uh, like I said, XG is not the be-all and end-all. Helps us give a shorthand for things. But in this game, Chelsea took 27 shots, had seven on target, and were never in the game. They never showed any flow. They never showed any strength. Had any of those gone in, maybe it's a different story, but they didn't. And so those moments of quality that clearly Chelsea have quality players, Jao Felix, uh, Kovacic, uh, Havertz, they're all really good players. Uh, Kante had a good chance. Uh, Reese James almost got one in the corner. They're all really good players and you're living in these moments, but moments aren't enough. A lot of the shots were just trying to make something happen, whereas you know, with with Aston Villa, you have a strength and understanding of what is going to happen between Watkins, between Buendia. They're working well together. You've got a clear partnership with um, McGinn, uh, McGinn, Louise, and Ramsey. They were able to get Kamara back in, and then that back four is solid. It's the same group. It's always Kanza. It's always Mings. And, you know, the, the fullbacks were rotated in and out. Sometimes it's Dinya, sometimes um, sometimes it's Moreno. Ashley Young got some run. So that core that core group of four that I really like to think of, the box between um, Louise, Ramsey, sorry, the box, the four between Louise, Konza, Mings, and Martinez. That's their core group of defense. You always know where they're going to be. And then Ramsey... Uh, sorry, and then uh, Buendia and and Watkins really running the channels. They got their first goal. Uh, <laughs> Ollie Watkins just working hard. Long ball right over the top. Watkins, Cucurella doesn't communicate with Koulibaly. Typical, not playing in the same back four all the time. Like I talked about Potter, very classic Potter problem. Cucurella heads it right into Watkins, who finishes, who's now been scoring goals for fun. He, I think he's got to be let's see how many goals does Watkins have now he's got to be he's on 10 so he's finally on 10 in the league 10 with five assists is really really a good return his xg right in line with where you expect him to be that's now three seasons of the row 14 11 10 really good return for ollie watkins who you know one of these things where the guy was scoring in the championship for brentford comes the premier league scores brentford developing strikers man that's not good for uh, Ivan Tony, who's probably going to want to move as well, provided he doesn't go to jail for gambling or just get, get a fine. So, and then McGinn with a thunder cunt of a blast at edge of the box, just hammers it home. John McGinn has been fantastic. And Chelsea just listlessly fail. They pop it around. Nothing really happens. Um, and the crowd were restless. And there goes Potter. He just looks like a broken man. Uh, nothing really happens. Jao Felix is the best player on the team. Fernandez again, Felix. Uh, I would say Mudric had a really good chance. He was in on goal by himself, but just flubbed his shot, just rolled it to the keeper. A guy in form finishes that. I thought maybe he should have gone around, but he shot from like 18 yards out. Just a team without a plan. Sorry, a team without confidence, a team without cohesion. Chelsea just never connected with each other. It's like they need to go to like a religious camp and like sit in a sauna together for hours and tell stories to each other so that they can get to know each other. Cause right now there's nothing, there's nothing there. Um, they need to do like trust falls, go to camp Talcott where I learned all my things uh, when I was a kid, they just need a break. They need to get themselves back together. They got big games coming up, Chelsea. They still have to play Real Madrid and weirdly they might beat them for all I fucking know. Football is goddamn weird. Football is weird. Um, I want to sort of capture the relegation. Actually, let's go to Leicester. Uh, they lose to Crystal Palace, the game that puts Brendan Rodgers over the edge. Are you ready for this one? Crystal Palace, 31 shots, nine on target, 
with Lester only taking three but scoring one. I knew when I saw the numbers on a half, I'm like, oh, Lester's going to grab a goal and just win this thing 1-0 because football is cruel. And Pereira did just that early in the second half, comes on for Tete. They turn it around. Their first half is catastrophically bad. Uh, but Pereira scores an amazing goal from Castagna. Then uh, Eze scores a wonder goal that goes off the back of the keeper on a free kick. Iverson is in. Don't know what happened to their other keeper. I guess uh, Brendan Rodgers is rolling the dice. Uh, they get a second from, they get a 94th minute winner from Philip Mateta. And the justice of football is served with Palace taking 37 shots. That's more shots than they've taken in two months. I don't know what Roy Hodgson did. I think they were free. I think he just said, go fucking play. It's Leicester. Enjoy yourself. But Leicester were fucking woeful, just awful. A kind of performance that gets your manager fired. Did they do it on purpose? Probably, probably. So uh, Brendan Rodgers, no longer of service to the great and powerful um, Leicester City you know that 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 championship is now moving further and further into the distance. Uh, Suter has not changed the the fortunes of the club. Uh, Christensen was pretty good. He scored. Um, he 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 held them together, but it doesn't look like uh, anything was going on there. Danny Ward was benched, so that was their old keeper. Now they have Iverson in. He's no Allen Iverson. He's just Iverson. Uh, but you know, I don't know. Lester's too good to go down. And whoever takes over this team will have a team that'll probably just score 30, take 31 shots themselves. Uh, so, you know, he played the same group. Edward, Zaha, Alisi, uh, Schlup, Decore, Eze, Gehi, Anderson. Did bring in old boy Joel Ward with Tariq Mitchell. Uh, Gaeta back in goal. Thank God. I don't know what that other experiment was. Maybe Gaeta was hurt. But uh, yeah. Palace are too good as well, and they just needed to be freed. Um, Zaha did go down, worrying for them because their downturn for Vieira was dirt when Zaha was out. But I think Vieira was a little bit of a panic firing. Um, they had a tough, tough, tough uh, run of fixtures that Vieira just couldn't really get together. I do want to give a shout, sorry, for Philip Mateta. Their first goal by a striker in like... Four million years. The touch and turn at the end of the game was just incredible. Just hoping that somehow um, the strikers for for uh, Leicester turned themselves around. Far, sorry, for Crystal Palace turned themselves around. So they get a win. Leicester in the bottom three, currently sitting at 19. Brendan Rodgers out. Crystal Palace get their win. Wolves won, won with Nottingham Forest. Tough, tough game for the great and powerful uh, Forest. You expect them to win at home. They had the XG battle. Uh, Brendan Rod, Brendan Johnson did score a goal. His hair, that red fucking hair looks terrible. But Pedence came on and made a difference. He's a good little player. Mike and I had always liked him. He scores the goal on a rebound. Um, but there is a little bit of trouble in this game. He may have spit on someone, possibly on Johnson. Not sure. Uh, the deflected shot by Pedro Neto that Potens puts in on 83. Uh, there was a chance at the end there for Morgan's Gibbs White, but he couldn't get it done. And uh, the front and and Steve Cooper is now in trouble as well. So he needed this one, and we'll see if the great and powerful Forest can get themselves together. I'm a fan of Cooper. I'm not sure this team has enough cohesion to get itself over the line. I love Felipe. Nico Williams came in. Toffolo came in. They're always chopping and changing. There's so many players in Nottingham Forest. You just don't know what the right group is. He went with a battling group in the midfield of Danilo, Freeler, and Mangala. They've played the most, uh, but we'll see what that front three can do. I really love Brendan Johnson. He's shown himself to be a Premier League player along with Morgan Gibbs-White. We'll see where they go. They really needed that win, and Podence spoils the day for Nottingham Forest also still in the relegation battle. Speaking of the relegation battle, the mighty, powerful Gary O'Neill and his Bournemouth boys do take it to Fulham like I said they would. Fulham, paper tiger. They are living on borrowed XG uh, and the power of Paulina. Although Fulham did take the lead from Pereira, a really nice goal. First half, really clear, nice 
easy game there for them. But Gary O'Neill has the mighty, powerful Bournemouth fighting till the end. I like what I see from them. I knew Solanke got a goal late to, for the win. Uh, and Bournemouth take all three points from Fulham. Fulham now fading in out of the out of the European opportunity. Uh, Daniel James had a really good chance that he just straight up fluffed his lines late. I'm just trying to see the moment. Uh, where is that one? Maybe it was early. Oh yeah, right at the end, blocked on 87. He just completely flubbed his lines. But everyone keeps saying it's Bournemouth and Southampton that are gonna go down. But are they? If it's not Bournemouth now sitting in 16th, uh, West Ham do get their win against Southampton. That's going through the whole relegation battle. Uh, Ayard, I knew Ayard would score. He's so good. But Southampton, you know, they're so up and down. You don't know what you're going to get. Some days you're like, wow, this team's really good. And then other days they're just not. Uh, They just don't have the goal scorers. Uh, Theo Walcott still playing. I mean, come on, man. That dude scores a goal once every fucking blue moon. Uh, But I do worry for West Ham. They simply don't create enough opportunities. Just don't create enough opportunities. Jared Bowen led the team in expected goals, but of course didn't score any. He adds to his number of expected goals that are not goals. (laughs) But uh, David Moyes gets his stay of execution. And again, West Ham's underlying numbers are very, very good. I still think that nine win, that nine win number will be the number that gets teams out of the relegation fight. Uh, and there's a lot of midweek games. We'll go to those in a minute, but let's go to the table, see where it is, give everyone a sense of a snapshot. Arsenal still eight points clear. Newcastle ahead of Man United on goal difference, and it's an 18-goal difference. So Man United have to beat Newcastle outright to be in third. The fourth-place battle, Spurs. I do have to talk about Spurs. I'll talk about them in a minute. Actually, I'll talk about them right now. They drew at home, uh, at Everton a game that they had in hand. There was controversy. This game was very Evertonian, very dice, very loud, very fun. Um, the punditry who didn't watch the game are saying this game is boring. This game was not boring. This was a great 1-1. It was dirty. It was nasty. The Corey got sent off for slapping Harry Kane in the face, who went down like he was shot with an air rifle from right point-blank range, gets the Corey sent off. Then uh, Mora comes on to try, and add, to try and add some running to the game. He tries to break someone's leg. He's not a genius for doing that. And Everton get a late goal from Michael Keane, who I called not minutes before the worst defender I've ever seen after giving up a penalty to Harry Kane. Spurs were up. Kane scored the goal. It felt like they had gotten themselves off the schneid. But then inexplicably, with the lead, Spurs decide that they need to keep trying to play out from the back. It was fucking suicidal. It was completely insane. They almost lose two or three times by playing out from the back and they don't close down Keane. He's got the ball in the midfield. He's carrying, carrying, and carrying. Everything opens up for them and he lets go a thunder cunt of a blast. Michael Keane, the shittiest defender I have ever seen, gets it done. Dice uh, when they're de- when it's 10-10 because of when it's 10 on 10 after Mora uh, disappears. I guess those extra players make a difference in the pitch, but who had uh, Michael Keane on the bingo card for scoring the winner in the 90th minute? Incredible scenes, incredible stuff. I thought a really enjoyable game. Spurs didn't create shit, nothing, zero, zero. They had, they were up a man from 58. They had a, they had 30 minutes up a man and still only had eight shots uh, on target. Sorry, eight shots total, two on target. Still not really creating anything, not really doing anything. There's no creativity in this side. When Skip and Hoiberg are there, they're not good. I think Spurs fans, you think maybe you needed Betancourt? Maybe you should have kept Tange and Dombele? You need creative players. You can't. Spurs and fucking and Spurs and Chelsea have the same problem, except Kane is creates for himself. Uh, Son also had a terrible game, couldn't get his shot to fall, had one chance, he was offside, otherwise very quiet, spending way too much time defending deep. I don't understand 
what he's doing down there. How the fuck are you supposed to score when you're in your own 18 yard box? Just stay high, be a dick, be greedy, score goals. Let Kane stay deep and do all those things. So Spurs with the one, one draw at Everton, not really that bad of a result. It was the manner of the result that really hurt Spurs. If you'd have said one, one where Spurs are, where they're feeling not the end of the world, but they're now sitting in the five slot United ahead of them on 50. So the top four are Arsenal city, Newcastle and United only separated by a point. Tottenham are still there. They're still plus 12. Uh, and then Brighton on plus 15, sitting on 43 with two games in hand. Uh, they have the best shot to break into that top four, top five party. Uh, Brentford, and they play an amazing 3-3 game. Just bonkers. The first half saw uh, five goals <laughs> in it with McAllister winning it um, in the 90th, uh, drawing, sorry, drawing uh, Brighton level. In the 90th minute, they had 4.2 expected goals to Brentford's one and a half. They battered Brentford. What an incredible performance by the great and powerful uh, Brighton. 32 shots, 13 on target against Brentford. A good defensive team. They absolutely battered them. Uh, and getting a draw was not their just rewards. They gave up three goals on a throw-in and two set pieces. Classic Classic Brentford. They make you earn it. They really, really do. Uh, Pontus Janssen, um, you know, got with one. Matoma brought him level on a direct kick off the kickoff from Steel to Matoma, who chips the keeper. Amazing stuff. Then right after, on the kickoff, Tony scores a goal from Mbuemo and Pontus Janssen. Danny Welbeck got the header from Solly March to bring the game back to 2-2. Then Pinnock on another dead ball pass. From Mbuemo does get the goal, and it looks like um, it looks like Brentford were going to take all three points, but then a clear, clear uh, penalty uh, for McAllister, who puts the game away. But Brighton were fantastic in this game, even though it's a three-three draw. What a bonkers game! Brighton are just the fucking best. Uh, I love this team still even despite Potter being fired. It's still Potter's boys, and Roberto De Zerbi deserves all the credit. This team is flying and scoring goals like crazy. So um, that's where we are. Let's look at the table again. Like I said, Arsenal, top of the league, top four, City, Newcastle, Tottenham, Man United, separated by just the top three and four, separated by nothing. They're all level on points on 50 with uh, Newcastle um, having two games in hand. Sorry. With Newcastle and United having two games in hand on Tottenham. Brighton sit on 43 with level with Brentford. Liverpool on 42. Villa on 41. Fulham on 39. Chelsea on 38. That is the top half. That's the European battle. And then that 12 to 20 separated by seven points. Palace getting the win really takes them clear. So the big movers there were Palace and Bournemouth who get out of the bottom three. Your bottom three as of today leads at 18 on 26. Leicester City on 25 in 19th with Southampton bringing up the foot of the table on 23. So West Ham, Everton, Nottingham Forest, and Bournemouth all on 27. Wolves on 28, Palace on 30. So still up for grabs. Every week, someone is going to go up or down out of the bottom three. Just an incredible war to save yourself from the Premier League. The two favorites, Leicester and West Ham, have got to get themselves out of there. Only David Moyes has kept his job from that bottom seven. Everyone else has changed their manager. <laughs> so now that Brendan Rodgers has changed. So just Moyes hangs on with his beloved uh, West Ham. I could see them finishing in 12th easily. Uh, they could just start winning. But we do have more matches. Tuesday and Wednesday, we have more matches. Tuesday, she's Leeds versus Nottingham Forest. This is about as big as a game as there is for both these clubs. It's at Ellen Road. So Forrest have their work cut out for them. If Steve Cooper can get an away win 
it will be massive for him. Then Bournemouth host Brighton in a seaside affair. Uh, Brighton going east, going out west to Bournemouth. Um, I would expect Bournemouth would get smoked in this game. They could give up five, but they may want to worry about their uh, goal difference. Then Leicester hosts Aston Villa without Brendan Rodgers. Who knows what's going to happen there? Then the big, big, big one. More managers, more big games. Chelsea host mighty Liverpool in the mid-table clash. Chelsea on 38, Liverpool on 42. Chelsea can pull up one point behind them. Does Liverpool have one of their performances in them? I don't know. They simply don't win on the road either. They're in trouble. Then on Wednesday, we have the mighty West Ham hosting Newcastle United. That'll be a big one. I can see a draw written all over that one. Then United play Brentford at Old Trafford. Remember, early in the season, this was the second game of the season. They went to Brentford and got annihilated uh, early in the season. Bit of the early uh, season, Ten Hag. United need a win here. This will be a difficult, difficult, difficult game. I would honestly say right now, Brentford are the better team. They simply are the better team. Um, you can look at every metric you can find. They don't have more talent, but as a unit, they are better. Uh, Brentford and Man United by expected XG. Brent uh, United on plus 4.9. Brentford on plus 3.4. So they're right behind each other in the XG difference table. Um, United a half a goal better. Uh, Brentford a half a goal worse in defense, a, a full goal worse in defense by XG. Their actual numbers, Brentford on 46 goal, 37 against. Uh, United on only 41 goals, uh, 37 against. Brentford have the better goal difference, shockingly. Uh, but 13 draws is what holds them back. And they have Ivan Tony, and you don't. <laughs> I love that game. I will be keeping an eye on that Brentford United game. Should be a good one. United are going to have to bring their big boy pants to fight against the tough, tough Brentford side who are going to kick, claw, scream, scratch to try and get the points that they want and they need to move up the table. That was a lot. We said goodbye to Brendan Rodgers. We said goodbye to Graham Potter. We talked institutional football. We went through the entire fixture list and we covered these games coming up on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about all those games and preview what happens next. So come back, come back, come back. If you're listening this far, well, I want to thank and say happy birthday to Mike Salerno, my partner who founded this show with me. What a great dude. I love him dearly. Happy 35th birthday, buddy. Um, you are missed. This show would not be what it is without you. And we want you to come on anytime you want to. Love you, buddy. Love to Jess. Take care. That was the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports Channel and presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're listening on Apple, please rate and review the show. 